Hello, this is James Reese from Razorwire. Uh, we're here today to do another interview. Um, I'm pleased to introduce you to Richard Cassidy. He's the Senior Director for Strategy for XV, a company we've done a lot of work with uh, recently, and we're looking to do a lot more work with in the future. So Richard's been, been very kind and saying that he would come on and have a chat to us, you know, about InfoSec, his views, that kind of thing. So welcome, Richard. Do you want to kind of introduce yourself to the to the guys that are, guys and girls that are watching? Yeah, absolutely, James. First of all, thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity. Um, I'll talk to anybody that listens, but um, I only get excited about those that uh, are a little bit more interesting than normal. And you're certainly up on that list. Um, uh, so yeah, look, I, I won't bore the viewers, stroke listeners, with too much of my history. It's long and illustrious at parts, but. Um, so I am in the industry about 21 years now, um, which is kind of an interesting sort of tenure, right? Because I've seen a lot of the technology waves, which we now take for granted, especially if you're new to InfoSec, you know, you, 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 you kind of at the point in the mountain where it's an ever ending incline. Um, but what's interesting is I've kind of seen the, found, the foundations build themselves out, right? We're talking way back to IP based firewalls and IP tables and Linux systems, I mean, back in the day. Um, and then, you know, through the various waves of innovation around firewalling, encryption, acceleration in ASICs, and, you know, and then the virtualization bandwagon took place, and then cloud was not really a thing, and then it became a massive thing. And, then DevOps, DevSecOps. So I've been, I feel honored to have seen a lot of these things kind of progress. Um, where I'm at now is with Exabeam, uh, a phenomenal business. I think what we're doing at this organization is very interesting. Um, and I joined it for that reason. I'm sure we'll touch on this a little bit later. I'm Senior Director of Security Strategy. So my job really is to impart as much of that useful and some of it probably less useful experience to uh, the kind of CISO practitioners. So I, try to, I try to be the bridge that that, that sort of helps cross the knowledge between what happens at the coalface of InfoSec versus what happens at the kind of strategic decision-making level, um, which I think is really important because I'm a practitioner. I came from the hands-on SOC-based background, sort of IT ops background. Um, and I find that a lot of people higher up the food chain in terms of organizations lack a lot of appreciation for what that is and why that matters in their business and why they should invest in the people and the, the processes around it. So I feel honored that I'm able to get to the table with CISOs to bring that world, which we're all a part of, to, to, to the board and to the people that make the decisions on, on, on things that will ultimately change people's careers. Um, so, you know, I suppose if I distill the last five, four years, it's mainly been security ops. So I've built SOCs, European SOCs. I've worked at level one, two, three, and then threat hunting and, and all sorts of weird and wonderful things. So I've been part of major breach investigations for car manufacturers, for utility companies. Um, and it's been a really interesting ride. Um, and here at Exabeam, I'm kind of bringing that experience to, to really help organizations understand um, how to weaponize their data, how to get one step ahead in terms of risk compliance, but also the big cyber warfare, which we are all very much on the front line of today. So there you go. I, I did it in less than an hour. Hopefully that's not too much of an intro, but but that's me in a nutshell. No, that's fantastic. I mean, how did you initially get into it? I mean, what made you sort of sit there one day and go, you know what, I think I want to get into security. You know, was it something you kind of fell into or was it something that you planned to get into, you know, or was it a bit of both? Yeah, so it's the most, it's the most convoluted kind of, I say convoluted curveball story because um, I, <laughs> I've always had an interest in computing, right? So from a very young age, I remember getting my first Amiga-based system and then I became Commodore and then the C64, the one you had to program, do you remember? To get yeah. your games to run with the old tape decks. Um, so I was always fascinated by how could this coding language create visual effects of the ilk that we saw. And even before that, right, you would just have games you wrote in DOS and uh, there'd be like multiple choice kind of answers and, and you'd kind of get through a, a labyrinth and something like that. Um, but I found it interesting. How does this all work? Like, how can I make electrical currents pr 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 produce all of this magic before your eyes? Um, so I got into kind of a bit of coding as a, as a, as a kid, probably as young as 10, to be fair, if, I, if I'm being honest. Um, real basic stuff back in the day. Coding was so much easier, wasn't it? Um, and then I decided to get into the sort of the whole how to build these things. It was all very interesting. And that just became a hobby, right? So it wasn't something I thought I'd ever have a career in. I just always loved computers. 
Um, so in terms of uni, I went and did a psychology degree. It had nothing to do with IT, or, or so I thought it would have nothing to do with IT or InfoSec. Um, and then just got a job uh, with a, a kind of an IT support company uh, in at Morgan Stanley Bank in Canary Wharf of all places, replacing printer cartridges. Um, and I remember having a conversation with a, a company uh, not so small called Sun Microsystems that were providing the firewalls to uh, Morgan Stanley at the time. And we're going way back, like way back. Um, and I was like, oh, what's a firewall? Anyway, long story short, that just blew my mind about how we could actually take some of the knowledge I'd already built in terms of some basic coding. And, and that led into a real flair for InfoSec. And I, I started to go and and decide to learn more about this and and that journey went to where it is now so i'm not i'm not going to bore you with all of the steps but that's kind of how i fell into it from a psychology degree to an it technician job at a bank to where i am now um and there's many interesting stories along the way that's for sure no i mean that's 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 actually really interesting and it's something that i've i've mentioned a few times and some of the other guys that are you know that i've people that i've interviewed before have mentioned um psychology you know it's it's the last thing most people would think would be important in something like information security or or it but over the years i've found it to be probably actually one of the the most important it's not even really a soft skill is it i mean it's it, you know we talk about hard skills and soft skills you know hard skills like risk management and that kind of stuff you know we can all learn that relatively quickly yeah. and relatively easy especially if you've got a good mentor but psychology is something else entirely if you can understand how to read room if you can understand you know how to gain that rapport with with the people who you're potentially delivering some pretty horrible news to or some really good news i mean it can go either direction really can't it but you know by understanding psychology and the, the at least you know a good level of psychology of how to interact and communicate with people can go a long way to really driving your career and being seen as a really good enabler of of, of the business as opposed to what i think some people view you know traditionally anyways what some people viewed security as, as being a bit of a disabler a bit of a you know fear uncertainty and doubt and the doomsayer, you know, the doomsayer has come into the meeting. Oh God, you know, here we go. They're going to start start talking about vulnerabilities and you know disassembling what we're trying to do and create and build. You know, have you found that to be particularly valuable? So it's a it's a phenomenal question, um, and we could probably run a podcast just on this subject and multiples thereof. Um, so what I <laughs> What I find, right, so either you gain experience and you learn how to communicate with your peers through trial and error, right? And, and, and uh, Oscar Wilde once said, um, famous Irish playwright, that wisdom is knowledge without pain. Um, but unfortunately, as we all know, and especially if you have kids um, and you're one of those teenagers, we all like to play a fool and, and learn the hard way sometimes. And that's just, just nature of human psychology. Um, so what that means is when you're at the table with your peers, with your superiors um, and also subordinates, right, because you'll end up at different levels in your career, um, is never just to listen to, to the question that gets asked has so many more layers to it than you've probably cared to realize in your career. Now, regardless of what stage you're at, I don't care now if you're a seasoned CISO and you've been in the game for 35 years or if you're just starting out, this rings true at any level of your career. If you just get transactional in your conversations, you know, and you think everything's black and white, that's where you're going to find it very difficult to get to, to influence people, to get the outcomes you're looking for, um, and then to kind of move up the ranks and 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 kind of you know progress your career, which is kind of what we all want to do, um, so that we can, we can retire early and do the things that we we really enjoy before we get too old to do them. So you know, when you when you see see these naysayers in a room. Don't just consider that they're a naysayer because they're belligerent or difficult, right? That might be the case. I mean, there are those people, but they've they've come through bad experiences. They've come through things that have made them that kind of person. So when I get this very difficult, sort of very cantankerous, you know, almost passive aggressive questions like, well, I, I don't possibly think your product can do this. Or I've seen it all before. This isn't going to happen. I don't go defensive. And this is what a lot of people do in conversation. They go, well, actually, 
I, I, I'm, this is true because no, you've got to just take a breath. Okay. And actually one of the biggest psychological tricks to stop people in their tracks when they ask very passive aggressive questions and get fairly, I suppose, heated in conversation is to just ask a completely different question. And the one question you ask is kind of, are you okay? Question. So you mm. say, wow, there's, I understand what you're saying. There's a lot behind there. So where, where has that come from in terms of experiences? What, what have been the failures of products or vendors in the past that have, that have got you to this point? So you're not answering the question of, well, I don't think you can do X, Y, Z. You're changing the conversation to a consultative, I care about your journey. Mm -hmm. And that immediately builds rapport in a way that you cannot estimate. Uh, you know, it's so super important. And now they start to understand you're there for the reasons that they care about most, which is actually you care about the problem. You're not just trying to sell them a product or a service. Uh, people don't like being sold to but they like to be consulted and feel like they're a friend, feel like they're, you're on a journey. So don't get defensive in your, in your answers. Don't get caught up in the black and white transactional conversations. Think beyond the question, look at the emotions, the nonverbal cues. And in that respect, psychology in terms of reading people has been really, really helpful uh, for, for me and for lots of other people that follow the same, same systems and processes. Fantastic. I mean, again, it's I, th I think it's an important part of InfoSec and definitely in the early days, you know, I'd meet up with InfoSec people, you know, say 20 odd years ago. And I did find that quite often the InfoSec people of the time were the types of people that nobody really knew what to do with, you know, so they, they put them in the InfoSec function and I think what it did in the early days was it, it kind of soured, especially from IT people, development people, you know, approaching InfoSec people for any kind of, of advice because they just had this view that we were these difficult individuals that, that were only there to cause them pain. Yeah. Um, and, and as I said, sort of like before we started, you know, my first mentor, and cheers, John, out there if you're watching. Um, he was, he was the one that first kind of turned me on to things like NLP to, to start kind of breaking down some of those barriers and actually talking to people. And, and he gave me very similar advice actually to the, to, to the one that you just said about reframing that question to, to, you know, not to kind of go on the attack or the defensive when someone's challenging you, but say, look, where does this come from? What's the, what's, what's the problem? You know, is it, something to do with with your experiences in the past how can we how can we make this you know how can we make this better really is the is the way that you answer that in many respects obviously not uh, quite so direct but no and so james and you raised a really good point right how, how does the business view us as infosec people i'm not going to say professionals because you know professionals are very the 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 goalposts of the term professional moves every week, depending on what the latest APT groups are doing in nation states. But anyway, um, so, and if you, I, I don't know if any, if you're, if our listeners or viewers have ever seen the, the it crowd, right. And yeah. I think that, I think that genuinely personifies the business view of it, right. We're, we're the guys and gals that just go and fix stuff and make computers work. And, and we're always resigned to the basement, you know, and we don't help ourselves. You know, I, I remember socks, we, we love dark rooms. We like it to all be mood lighting because that kind of helps the creative juices flow, right? Um, and so you get the executives that walk into these places thinking, oh my days, this is this is a different league of people. <laughs> um, and so we don't do ourselves any justice. You know, we don't, we don't like to be approachable. But um, so, and here's why, right? If I think of, there's so many things that I think are career killers in some respects for IT security professionals. And so I think the number one for me is, is, um, is believing that you're the, or acting like you're the smartest guy in the room or girl in the room. Um, and look, there's no doubt that the security industry attracts some of the most incredible minds, um, it, it, you know, out there in all across all industries. Um, and we often believe we're the smartest in the room. A lot of the times, you know, you're going to these people that, that, only, that, that barely know how to turn on a computer or, you know, connect a Bluetooth mouse, let alone understand what, what drives it. Um, but if you, if you give that persona and you come across that way to anybody that, that gets defensive, that, that's just a human nature. It's a challenge. You know, it's, it's the old peacock syndrome. Um, and, and you really shouldn't make your, 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 your team and your management feel less smart than you, even if they're not in the subject that you're talking about. 
Um, so, you know, even true brilliance will only get you so far um, and your technical skills will take you places, but you've got to take a approach where you come across, as I said earlier, trusted, you care about the problem and you're able to articulate complex in a very simple way. And I think if there was one of the skills I said that's really got me through this career, it's been able to take super complex concepts, like even the most complicated attacks that, it, that, that I've ever had to go and do breach investigations for. When I talk to the board, I'm using crayons and big pictures and I'm making it sort of as easy to understand as possible. And if they want to go deeper, we will go there. But we kind of start here and work back. Right. And I think don't act like the smartest person in the room because you are going to rub people up the wrong way. It's just human nature. And that's a career killer right there. Um, and I'll pause on that point because you probably want to ask some questions about it. But I think that's the number one failure you'll ever sort of come across if, if, if you're kind of starting out in InfoSec or midway through your career. <coughs> Excuse me. You touch upon something quite interesting there. I mean, you know, obviously your background is investigating, you know, serious events that are occurring through SOC or whatever. You know, it sounds like psychology has been a really, really important <laughs> skill for you because, I mean, once you've done your investigations or at least your initial investigations and you've got a bit of a picture of what's going on you then have to go to either the customer or or you know if you're working directly for that client who are running that sock at that time potentially the you know the c-suite people and to, to to deliver them some pretty horrible news at times you know have you found it to be immeasurably important in the way that that, that you handle that yeah, without a shadow of a doubt, um, you know, and I'm, we're, we're probably setting the stage here for, you know, even if you haven't already done it, thinking about kind of just short courses in, in NLP, neurolinguistic programming, um, or things like this, because actually, the more that we talk about this, the more I even realize in retrospect that actually the psychology aspect has been super important. And and it becomes nowhere more important than in a serious breach where we're in a high stakes scenario with the business is potentially at ruin because, you know, personal data and God forbid, you know, key assets are, are compromised and on, on the, the, the dark web for sale or even worse, just, just on the open web, just because they want to prove a point. And so what you have to do is not lose your call, not talk tech, uh, too techy to the people that are going to be having to go out in front of the media and, and talk about what's going on. Um, so you really have to take that sort of, I understand, I appreciate, I, I empathize with the challenges that you have, and I take ownership of this problem. I really psychologically um, understand what's going on. Um, and it's not life or death. I mean, that's that's what's really important. It, it is careers, it is money, but you've got to understand that that no matter how bad that problem is, there is a way forward. And even if the way forward's tricky and it's a sticky path, always try to calm down your audience, always try to explain the steps that we have to take and the risks of, the, of, risks of those different pathways, but do it in a way that's in, not subservient, but empathetic. Um, and, and again, understand that there's different levels of, of, understand, uh, of technical knowledge across the different sort of teams and just creating a message that's, that sort of resonates across that. So the psychology aspect is really important. You can't just talk tech. You can't just talk tactical. You have to be able to talk to, to the people. So absolutely right. Just out of interest, I mean, you know, there's, there's been a worrying trend. I mean, it's it's something that's happened. I say recently, it's th this whole kind of lockdown pandemic thing has kind of thrown off my, my, my concept of time, you know, but um, ransomware, um, you know, the malicious individuals that are doing ransomware attacks now, Initially, it was just, you know, you got your ransomware, it would encrypt everything and you'd get the nice little message that said, you know, pay up in Bitcoin or else you're not going to get your data back and that's it, you're screwed. Um, and then once they figured out that people could, you know, quite often get it from backups, they'd have a bit of a loss, but they could, they could get most of it back. They changed tact, didn't they? And they took a more of a kind of PR social damaging element of it by saying, okay, fine, we've encrypted your stuff, but we've also taken a copy of your stuff. Mm -hmm. And now we've got a copy of your stuff. If you don't pay up within however time, it's normally 48 hours, maybe a bit longer, then we're just going to release it. We're going to chuck it out there on the internet, all your HR records, all of your customer interactions, all of the problems that you've had, your books, obviously, you know, more often than not, you can get those online anyway, but 
all your dirty laundry is now going to be out on the internet. What's your opinion of that? I mean, is that is that something that keeps you and, and some of the people that you talk to, you know, the other CISOs up at night, or is that still something emerging that we should be worried about? Yeah, so really, <clears throat> so, so psychology, sorry to continue that theme, plays massively there too. I mean, if you think about, apart from the, the real kind of sort of sophisticated attacks that are sort of zero day in code and uh, the things that you can't really account for because you just don't know they're there because you didn't build the product. Um, but most of the attacks, almost all attacks that are successful are based on social engineering methods. Now, whether that's a ransomware uh, a, a, a application that makes its way through, you know, the email systems, or you click on a website that appears to be something you know and you download a file, it plays out in so many different ways. It, where they're playing to your psychology. They're trying to get you to do something you shouldn't. Um, and, you know, again, there's an element we're going to talk, probably touch on here called sort of around training, the cybersecurity culture and training. Has that really evolved to, for, to, to have people understand their ownership in the chain of security or security survival, as I call it now? Um, but without a shadow of a doubt, and to answer your question directly, almost all the CISOs I talk to, their biggest nightmare is phishing and ransomware attacks. Um, and there's a whole load of things behind that, but they're the two biggest nightmares and headaches that they have, because regardless of the type of security you use or the platforms or the products you put in place, they're still getting through and we're still seeing breaches off the back of them. So, um, and, and so how do we solve that? Uh, is technology the answer? Well, if it was, it would have answered the problem by now. Um, and, and there are all sorts of really clever technologies now. There's, there's new vendors on the endpoint that are that are doing memory obfuscation and all these sorts of things. You had Bromium that had got acquired by HP that decided to run hypervisors, you know, at the process layer. So kind of HAL on HAL. We're going back to NT4, right? That's that's how far God, back we're going. So wow. Even 3.5. Do you remember that one? Oh, my yeah, days. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but yeah. but that set. I mean I mean actually it goes back beyond that. Virtualization started back in DOS even long before NT. But anyway, we we digress into the old stories. Um, so even with all these clever technologies that should have contained the the bomb from exploding in our business, they haven't because ultimately users are your weakest link. And I know everybody knows that. But if we know that, what are we doing to change those habits of those users, of those weakest links in the survival or chain of security survival? Um, and I don't think we're doing a great deal. And I don't think we're understanding the psychology of what makes people do what they do um, and the human factors element. Um, so, so yes, big problem. Are we solving it effectively? Absolutely not. Um, and it's not technology. Technology is not the answer alone. We know that it's been proven over the last two decades. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you know, CD, CD Project Red are finding that one out at the moment. I don't know if you've you spotted that yeah. news, but, you know, having a, all of a sudden your, you know, your latest and greatest game code being uh, being stuck out there on the net. I mean, it's a real killer. And I feel sorry for those guys, you know, and you're absolutely right. You, you, you mentioned a really good point there. You know, technology is fantastic. It gives us the tools we need to, you know, need in order to give us the information that we want or to help us clear up. I mean, Exabeam is a great example of that and the way that you kind of show, you know, the, the, the journey for the individuals within your platform where, you know, the salesperson who's gone and downloaded the Salesforce database and, you know, then kind of uploaded it off to, to a separate location and started grabbing certain bits of information from places and, so on and so forth you know it's this is why i love exabeam as a product because there's very few products that do that um, but i do do love what you said that it's not just about the product there is so much that goes into being able to analyze what's going on being able to recognize you know when attacks are occurring but from simple little things i remember when i, I one of your site well, yeah i think it was one of your sales guys or pre-sales guys first showed me exabeam they, they showed me you know some of the example stuff that you've got on there and they showed me what was going on with one of the sales people, which is, you know, the example I just gave. I think I got two lines in, but because I've been in InfoSec for 25 years, I can recognize a pattern straight off the bat, you know, and I just went, that salesperson is uh, downloading the database because they're either leaving or they think they're about to, right. about to go. <clears throat> Brilliant way of, of, of displaying that information because previous information provided by scenes and other kind of technologies, usually it's really dry. It's like, you've got to look through hundreds of logs. You've got to try and pull it all together. I mean, tools have gotten better over the years that would pull yeah. alerts into one, but 
it didn't give you the elements that exabeam seems to give you and it sounds like i'm doing a kind of vendor plug here that's not my intent but but it's a good point you know some of the stuff that you guys are doing is really really good and so and, and look we, we won't do the the vendor plug because that's not what this is about but let's talk about how we again human factors <clears throat> respond best to understanding the context of a problem okay um you know and if you've got kids you'll re you, you'll resonate with this right you know you, you get your little girl or boy that comes in and says so and so did x um and you, that's one part of a, what turns out to be a very complicated story we all know as, as parents um and even not even not that if you have say, if you have brothers or sisters you'll be in the same boat so so it's very similar i know i'm i'm, I'm being very simplistic in security you know, if I tell you a fact, you'll remember it for a day or a week. And there's been psychological studies around this, this very notion. If I tell you a story, you often remember it for a very long time, if not a lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, and it's long been known in the American School of Sales, you know, story time is always the best way. People love stories. And we do because it actually personalizes the, the issue that we've got. And so let's bring that to cybersecurity. Um, I, I think vendors are, have a massive amount of ownership to take on here with regards to the way that they've been training and uh, enabling security professionals to uh, decide what problems are. We've been fairly systematic in our approach. I mean, look, back in the day when I started out doing basic incident triage, you know, it was right, what's the, who's the user? Uh, what's the IP address is? What are the devices those connected to? Um, what are the applications that we used? And so on and so forth. So you'd have this kind of manual workflow playbook checklist that you'd go through. Um, but we never asked the question back in the day, oh, what's the risk? What's the risk I'm solving here? What's actually at risk? Mm -hmm. You know, because we got very focused on all of the user and the, the kind of what they call the indicators of compromise. Um, and a lot of technologies today are still doing that. They're still saying, I'll give you a 100% a increase on your rate of detection and I'll show you loads more alerts based upon high severity and I mean, are you kidding me? We need less of that. What we need is, you know, almost that jigsaw puzzle being built as much as it could be built before our very eyes so we can play out the story. And this is where I believe, you know, we're all worried about AI taking over and becoming, you know, it, can't, it possibly can't. Human brains for human problems, right? AI will take you so far in the journey down the river of, of security outcomes. It's our brains, it's our minds that can, connect dots that machines can't connect because they just don't know all of these disconnected devices. Whether, whether you're talking about neural net learning, I don't care how deep you go into this, this subject. Right now, AI is not a threat to security and security DevOps and the businesses. So by having platforms like Exabeam, right? And, and there are others, I'm sure, that say, hey, this was where the alert started, but actually here's all of the other details that may not have anything to do with this problem, but actually more invariably than, than not, they do. Um, here's the story. Here's what happened before, during, and after. Why is that important? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll close out that point on this one. Um, we've always become fixated on solving the problem that we've been alerted to. So uh, there's been uh, an unauthorized upload to a file sharing site. Um, okay, well, let's stop that. Well, hold on a second. How did it even get there? What were the things the user did? Is it even that user? Has their account been compromised? How far back in the cycle did it go? And was it just the file upload that we have a problem with? Were there other compromised processes and applications inside the environment? Things that we trust that may have become compromised. So if you don't have a platform that's bringing in all of this detail and showing you the spot, literally the endless spider's web of activity that occurs, so you can make a real risk decision, you are just knocking the dominoes over that we've been knocking over for the past 20, 30 years. And you're just a big, big risk uh, waiting to happen in my experience. And I can say that from a lot of breach investigations, it's the same old problem. We didn't go deep enough. We didn't go wide enough because we couldn't because tech stopped us from doing it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I've done a fair few investigations in my time as well. And I used to, yeah, I still term it as, as following the threads. There's always threads to follow and you follow each thread to its conclusion. Once you're at the at that conclusion, quite often it leads into a lot of other threads, you know. Um, and, and people have said to me before, you know, when you're doing investigations, why does it take so much time to do? And it's like, because I've got to come back with a full view of what's happened. We've done the triage. We've done the stuff that to, to prevent it from getting worse. But what is the story behind this? And I, and I like that analogy. What is the story behind this breach? 
because we all know what the outcome probably is going to be. We all know, you know, we've got that gut instinct. And that's something, again, you mentioned about the stuff that AI doesn't have. Trust your instinct. You know, one thing I've definitely yeah. learned is normally my first impression, that first thing that clicks into my head is usually right or it's usually not far off being right. Absolutely. You know? yeah. um, and, and building that story when you're doing investigations is important because, yeah, you know, you could find out that it was a piece of malicious code, but then, as you quite rightly pointed out earlier on, how did it get in there? Was it a person who wasn't trained enough? Was, you know, how did it get past the email security? You know, what is this story behind it? Because we need to deal with the story. We don't, we can't deal with the, the outcome because that's already happened. The horse has already bolted, you know, the CD yeah. Project Red, they've already lost all their stuff. But, yeah. you know, um, what do you do? How did it get to that point? Deal with that and feasibly you may not have to deal with it again, assuming you survive it, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think we should touch on a subject here, which is important, which is, you know, what makes the world's top chess players so interesting is, you know, whoever, whoever you look at in terms of chess grandmasters, there's a commonality between them. Um, a, they all have brilliant minds, but they're able to play out the game's 20, 30 moves ahead of what the actual piece or the movement is at that time. And what does that mean in terms of cybersecurity? Well, it's almost like we wait for the problem to occur before we respond to it. I mean, we, we put in all these layers. It's like going out, you know, in, uh, in the cold winter and all these layers, but we don't actually think, well, you know, do we really need these? Are these effective? Have I got too much going on here? And the only way to know whether what you're doing is going to work is stress test it. Run scenarios in, in your organization where you simulate a breach. And I'm not talking about, you know, those internal blue teaming exercises and red teaming where you try to catch users out because that is a negative outcome. You make people mm -hmm. feel stupid and, and it has a counterintuitive effect to, to the overall cybersecurity culture you're trying to build. But do play out and, and, and play out what you know to be a risk to you. And this is the biggest challenge of every CISO I've spoken to. I ask this question. What are you protecting? And I can tell you nine times out of 10, I don't get the answer I expect because they don't yeah. understand everything they've got. Now, those that are able to give me at least an 80 percentile level of accuracy on, well, you know, we're a cloud based applications businesses. We serve X, Y, Z market. Um, so we have our AWS platform here. We also do hybrid clouds. We've got Azure here and it's all back. Great. So you know what it is. Fantastic. Where is your data? Well, it sits in the cloud. Does it really? Do you have offsite backups? Do you have resiliency systems built into on-prem? Is it all cola? Where and a lot don't know that answer. And then where is not just your physical assets, it's also your your human assets. Um, mm. And again, where do these people access the data from? So what you're protecting, where does it sit? And then the killer question: who do you think you're protecting your data from? And so many people have no idea. They, they, they just think it's the, whatever the nation state group is in the news of that week or month or year. Um, and the answer is it's, it's normally a very prescriptive set of, uh, of groups that will target you and you have to know how they target you. So now you've know these three things, right? And they're not, they're not easy questions to answer, but if a CISO can't answer them, I would question whether they've done the right level of due diligence in the organization that's going to help keep them secure. Once you know that, then you can play other games. You can rerun the, the, the scenarios and then you can empower your organization to become security culture aware. <clears throat> and it has to be a culture thing, right? This is the key point. Don't just think of security as a checkbox exercise that, that as a user, oh, I, thou, thou shalt not do X, Y, Z, you know, the, the 10 commandments of security. Are you kidding me? that's not how it works you've got to almost make it a, a religion within your business and I, i'm sorry to go down the, the the pious path but own it feel that it's a culture security should be part of the business culture as much as it is selling the service that you sell and if you can connect the two dots you've got one hell of a freight train um, and, and i think the old saying goes right culture eats strategy for breakfast um it sure does in security as well my friends Absolutely, 100% agree. I mean, one thing that you mentioned there that, that, that definitely you don't hear a lot of, and, and I mean, I've done it before um, and I've had some mixed results, but I like wargaming. 
I think wargaming is, is, you know, when you're running an infosec department or you're working with an information security department, wargaming possible issues that could come up is really, really beneficial, not only for sort of like managing the team and getting the team working together, but it just gets those juices moving. Yeah. You know, because once you once you've war games, you know, a data loss, you know, any type of data loss that occurs tends to follow similar kind of fashions. You tend to follow a similar kind of a vein in your, you know, the way that you investigate it and the way that you try to resolve it, you know, okay, it's not always a hundred percent, but the methodology is still there in your head if you're war gaming it. And I think that that doesn't tend to happen in a lot of, a lot of places, a lot of places, a lot of places are, you know, it's like, oh, we must get the latest and greatest AV technology and we must right. get this, that and the other. And, you know, it's like, okay, you, you've got all this technology, you've got all this stuff, but, you, you know, if an event was to actually happen, if it was to actually hit you in the face one day, you got the call, could you, could you run that incident? Now, most people will say yes, but then most of those people probably haven't done much in the way of, you know, high-end incident response you know they might have done the little bits like oh a bit of phishing stuff's come in but it hasn't really gone anywhere you know but not the really big stuff the the proper company destroying you know armageddon style issues that that do occur and that seem to be occurring a lot more frequently these days if you if you believe the media um it's interesting and it's it's i think it's for, for anybody up and coming in the infosec space definitely look at wargaming it's a bit like the old dungeons and dragons style stuff isn't it you know you all sit around the table and you do you know you tell the story and you're all part of the story and you all kind of go through it on a on a conceptual level but i think there's a lot of value in that definitely a lot of value in that just to even if not not more than seeing what people's capabilities are what mindsets they run We're going back into psychology now you know who's good at resolving issues of a technical nature, who's better off with the PR side of it to go to the directors and explain what's going on, you know, what are your thoughts? Oh, there's so many on this subject. Um, so I suppose, let, let's start with, if we were to take one industry that has absolutely nailed the way to uh, build a process and a set of systems and controls around having as close to zero an error rate as possible, it has to be hands down the aviation industry. Because if they get it wrong, um, it, it, get, it goes very wrong, right? Um, and we don't need to go into what those reasons are, we can all work it out. <laughs> so, so in the aviation industry, it goes back as far as 1993, um, Hawkins and Orlady would be the people we'd have to cite here that created what's known as the shell model of human factors. And this was actually built for aviation systems. And what shell does is it applies to every industry. I remember having a conversation in a pub <clears throat> before lockdown um, even was a thing um, about, you know, they were a large insurance business and they just kept having the same old attacks occur, people clicking on the same old links. And it was actually to do a lot with the remote workers, which is a very interesting point to dovetail in here because of the world we now live yeah. in. And they're like, we, we've deployed, you know, EDR tools to the endpoint. We've got, you know, uh, the, the most, you know, insane levels of anti access management control. We're zero trust capable. They throw out all the great bingo buzzwords and security, but we still can't stop the users from doing X. And it's the users that are remotely working, the ones flying around the world in hotels, the people we allow to work from home, we're finding a higher rate of, of, of breach for, through these users. I'm like, well, you have to apply the shell model of human factors. They're like, well, what are you talking about? I said, well, it's going to be one of these parts of the model that's going to be the problem. And the shell model is really, really simple. Um, it, in fact, what shell stands for um, is software, right? That's the S, H is the hardware. Then you've got E, which is environment. And then you've got L, which is kind of liveware. So, so first, so let's apply that to the insurance company's problem, right? Do you have a software problem? Is it the tools that you're running that are not effective? And the answer is no, they're giving us the alerts. We can see what's occurring. Um, so fine, so we're happy the software's given us the data points. 
well, let's talk about hardware. Are we capturing it quick enough? Do we have the right connections? What if we have to do forensics analysis in a remote environment? How do we even do that? Because you know, normally you'd take the desktop or the laptop and you'd or, or the virtual image and you'd copy it and you'd take dump some memory and go through all sorts of forensics analysis. Um, so have we thought about all the hardware elements and, and this business had to cover there's some very good remote sort of forensics processes. And then we got to E. I said, is it the environment? And they said, well, what do you mean? Well, what is it that's different in your office that means the rates of breaches are lower for these types of attacks versus outside? Um, and I think this is one of the biggest factors that of human factors that we're seeing in the in the post, or we're almost a post pandemic. I think we're coming out of it, but um, phase, which is you're working from home. You you you've got your your pets, your kids, or your your parents. You know, God forbid, some of us have to live with them. <laughs> uh, only kidding. With the greatest respect, I love my parents dearly. Um, you know, so you get all these distractions, and therefore your level of, um, I suppose discretion um, of kind of, you know, analysis of what's going on is vastly reduced because you've got your daughter, or your son screaming for a, a juice or um, you've got the Amazon delivery guy knocking on the door um, and you get this email that appears to be legit, but you didn't quite look at it. So you go, oh, I'll just click on that. So the environment turns out to be the problem. They get they get less comfortable um, with the fact that they're, they're, they're still a security representative of your organization. They're on the front line of cyber warfare, but they don't feel they are because they're in a nice hotel room or they're in their nice home office. So actually the environment doesn't create the security productivity we need. So how do you solve that? Well, we go back to cybersecurity training again, right? How do we give people the tools and, and empower them? And how do we upskill our level of monitoring in those environments to yeah. kind of be a concierge, you know, to proactively look for events of interest from our distributed workforce? So, and then L is liveware, which comes to, um, you know, more to do with kind of the human element as well. So is the training there, et cetera, et cetera. So, but if you apply that model to any cybersecurity problem, you'll find a single or multiple links in that chain that you can improve on. On. And that's an aviation system that's proven to be super successful for as long as aviation has been around. And I do, I, I would stand toe to toe with anybody that says aviation aren't the best in the industry at, at processes and, and workflows. They've nailed it and we could learn a lot from how they do it. And the shell model is one of those things. That's fantastic. I'm, you know, I've heard about it before, but I think, you know, after this, I'm actually going to sit down and, and revisit that, you know, because it's, that's brilliant and that's fantastic. So, so those of you out there looking to get into the industry, definitely look at the shell model. Um, it's, yeah. it's, you know, sounds like the, the, the best way to try and establish really what's going on and how to fix it and, and to deal with it. Sorry to add there, but James, if, if, they, if I was interviewing a candidate to come join my, organi my organization, and they talked about human factors and mm -hmm. shell model of, of human factors, I'd be blown away i mean you you're now thinking at a level that is beyond strategic it's it's truly game changing for the organization and it applies to any level of operation whether you're devops whether you're secops whether you're the sec devops team this model always shows where your weaknesses are and it's a very good way to analyze and assess your security capability and maturity so there you go guys anybody sort of googling richard and comes up with this video because you're going for an interview with him there you go that's all you need to do yeah, <laughs> the time the time is drawing on you're a busy man but i'm going to ask you the question everybody gets asked this question and everybody i expect an answer from everybody and we've had some really interesting ones um so let's go roll back through time back to when you got your first infosec job maybe you're in a bar maybe you're in a coffee shop you sat there you've just got the call from the recruiter or from the company saying you've got it you start on Monday or you start next week or whenever. Um, and you said, yes, I want it. If you could go back, sit down next to yourself, maybe with that pint or maybe with that coffee or maybe both, and offer yourself the young Richard Cassidy some advice, what would it be? Well, the first thing will be, why in the hell didn't you just spend a hundred pounds on Bitcoin? <laughs> uh, but anyway, I, I'm still kicking myself over that. Never mind. We move on. Um, so that's a really good question. Um, and I'll touch on a few things. So one thing I do, I would have said to myself, um, and I'm trying to fix that desperately now, is um, so I think Frank Sinatra came up with this this quote. Um, when you feel like you're coasting, that's when you're actually going downhill. I think he said it to his son. 
Um, and I know he applied that to showbiz, but actually it applies to security showbiz as well, right? And I remember thinking when I sort of done my, I started off in Cisco networking, you know, at ISP. So I, I got my CCMP and I thought, that's it. I'm the bee's knees. I've got this. Um, and I didn't, I didn't innovate quickly enough earlier on in my career. Um, and I probably wasted about five years doing kind of the same thing. And I remember my mentor saying, look, I know you want to go clubbing. And I know you want to do all the things that a 21, 22, 23 year old does. But, but let me tell you, you're burning your years. And what you need to do is learn the basics and learn them well. And I'm glad I, I heeded his advice, of the, albeit later than I should have. And I, I went and learned all the basics. You know, I can still tell you how bridges build their MAC tables and what, what CSMA CD is and Ethernet communication, because I really learned it. And it's still relevant today in my security role, you know, understanding communication protocols, you know, even right down to layer two of the OSI model is still super important in capturing those really, I mean, I've seen attacks embedded into firmware upgrades uh, of adapters uh, that are there just siphoning off data. I mean, that's, that's how much that knowledge still helps me 22, 23 years on. Um, so it's, it's, it's listen to those that are, are wiser than me. And I said it earlier, wisdom is knowledge of that pain, okay? Uh, do, do take on the advice of those that are there. And one of the things I was told to do early on, which I didn't do, and I'm, I'm paying the price now because my brain isn't what it used to be, is learn coding. I mean, I we all started out, I started out in Roscoe programming. I mean, that's, go, that's back in IBM AS400 mainframe stuff. Um, and I was offered to go on Python courses and Perl courses and back then VB sort of basic. And I didn't, you know, I thought I could just get away with my Roscoe skill set. Um, understanding coding and languages is super important for any level of security, sort of DevOps, DevSecOps engineer. And we're going into a future where devices will become open source in, in their nature. You're going to be able to repro, and you're already able to do it through if this, then that kind of protocoling with your, your IoT devices. But we will get to a point where you'll get a blank slate and your phone or your, your, your sort of home media system will be fully configurable. And if you don't understand programming and languages at, at our security sort of professional level, you're going to fall way behind the curve and you're going to become stagnant. Mm -hmm. So they're the two key things, right? Um, and then I suppose what I've learned, and I suppose what I would tell myself now, 22, 23 years on, is um, be, I've always found myself to be very tactical early on. And what I mean by that is, I have a problem to solve, I solve it. And I just do it because that's what I get paid to do. But the people that, that, that rise up the ranks quickly, the people that make it the biggest difference, the Elon Musks of this world, and I know he's a Marmite kind of guy, um, they're always thinking about how to make something different and not just doing it for the sake of doing it. And businesses want that. We want people that go, look, I get that you want me to follow this playbook for a, a breach investigation, but actually this part of that playbook can be automated. We can do this so much quicker. Or that manual task set that we're doing there, well, I've looked into open source technologies or, 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 or vendor commercial products, and these ones will save us seven hours, 10 hours a day, which is operationally, you know, several weeks of time back in a year. If you can have those level of conversations quickly, you can understand how to, how to sort of not automate your role completely, but, but, but sort of enhance it. You're going to become super important to the business decision makers, and you're going to find yourself very quickly becoming a strategic head in the, in, in the organization. And that's when things get more interesting. Um, and then I think sort of finally, it's it's sticking to yourself. And I know that's a very broad comment, um, but professionals in, in every discipline, right, um, in part, um, kind of help by helping others to do their jobs, right? You need to become that trusted partner to your colleagues and yeah. build relationships throughout the business, right? We all know that. And some of us find that sort of networking easy. Others find it much harder to do when we're not normally extrovert kind of people. Um, but actually, um, you've got to, as a security professional, uh, stick true to your kind of core skills. And, and, and they will always be, you want to make something work. You, you, you have the, the nature of the greater good in, in, in your kind of outlook. Um, so create more room, create your own opportunities um, by, by connecting more and by using your, your kind of core skills to, to, to develop your career. Don't, don't get into the imposter syndrome trap. It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. We always feel like we're not good enough or we shouldn't be where we are. 
That's total, absolute codswallop to bring a really old term back to the future. You are good enough. You can make a difference. Believe in, stick stick true to yourself, because it's in self-belief that others start to see what we can truly be, and that sort of builds success. Um, you know, there's always people smarter, and there's always people less smart, but know that you can do it, and don't ever think for a second you can't. Don't ever get imposter syndrome. It will destroy your career. Totally agree with you on that one. Totally agree. I've seen a lot of people go down that route and a, a lot of good people as well who just don't have that confidence. They don't believe in themselves. They don't they don't feel that they deserve what they've got. And it's like, stop it, guys. Just 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 go with the flow. Just go with it. It'll 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 be fine. You know, you are good at what you do. But it's been brilliant chatting to you, Richard. You know, I, there's a lot of subject matters that we've, we've discussed today that I'd love to expand upon at, at, at great length, but uh, time has come for us. And uh, I think I'd like to definitely sit down and have a conversation with you at some point about covering some of those other topics, be it on, you know, with your stuff that you do here, a mixture of both. But if any of you out there have got any uh, questions or whatever, just email them through to us. We'll let Richard know, and we'll we'll get you those so, answers. Yeah. I mean, you know, and if you if you've got anything you want us to put in a video, give us a shout. We'll reach out to Richard and see if we can do another one of those. You know, um, again, Richard, it's been fantastic. Um, for all those of you out there, um, please feel free to subscribe to the channel, press the little bell, um, you know, to get notifications. We do. All kinds of content all the time we're releasing on a weekly basis and we plan to do that going forward if you've got any questions about infosec let us know and we'll do some more content but richard thanks ever so much cheers yeah james been a pleasure thank you so much and looking forward to the next one <laughs> fantastic right cheers everybody and we'll all see you soon goodbye <laughs>